Hello everyone, my name is Tamara Nicholson. Welcome to Theories on Crowd Behaviour. Today we're going to be taking a look at a theorist named Le Bon, and let's begin by looking at some short video clips on crowd behaviour. The students marched through campus, clashing with the police. They reportedly threw missiles and trashed the campus. Police and security guards fired tear gas to disperse the crowd. Four students were detained. Today was the last day for registration. Okay, so now that we have an idea of what a crowd is, let's take a look at crowds in psychology. Uh, crowds are referred to as the elephant man of the social sciences, and this implies that there's something freakish about them. They're seen as strange, pathological, monstrous, and powerful. There's something about them, or at least the way that they've been theorized, that makes them seem separate from and different to everyday life and normal activities, and one of the reasons for this is their history. Research into crowds uh, began with the rise of industrialization in the 19th century and this was the birth of math so uh, mass society or modern urban life. So this is essentially when people started moving away from small villages with low density populations into higher density, density populations like cities. Um, and there were concerns over how this new population would be controlled because they were moving away from traditional control uh, mechanisms or social structures like the church, the family and the army and into cities. And there were uh, theories uh, that this movement would lead to a sort of rootlessness and mindlessness to an uncontrolled population with no uh, cultural bearings. And this population would be vulnerable to things like passing fads uh, and unscrupulous ad unscrupulous agitators. In other words, there were fears that this movement from these low density populations to high density populations and the resultant loss of roots and culture and uh, social structures that controlled, well, that exerted control of the population would result in social anarchy. So these new urban masses uh, were seen as a threat to society and the crowd was that threat made manifest or made real. Uh, the crowd was the threat embodied. Um, and according to Reicher, the crowd was the instrument through which anarchy would replace order. And that means that the beginnings of crowd theory lie not in a desire to understand the crowd and to figure out what's happening uh, in, in crowd activities, but rather to repress this rebellious and dangerous, um, well, potentially dangerous behavior. From these uh, rather dubious roots uh, that we trace Le Bon, who was a French theorist. He wrote a book called The Crowd, A Study of the Popular Mind. Here's a picture of the man himself sporting quite an ambitious beard slash mustache. Um, and he saw the crowd as a sort of collective mind, which makes them feel, think, and act in a manner quite different from that in which each individual of them would feel, think, and act were he in a state of isolation. And so right from the beginning there, you get the sense that there's a complete and utter divide between the individual and the crowd. There's no transfer between the individual from the individual to the crowd or the crowd to the individual. The key concept behind his work is that of submergence. And this marks the transition from individual to crowd psychology. And uh, the basic idea behind it was that as soon as you became a crowd member, as soon as you joined the crowd, there was a loss of self, a loss of self-control, and also a loss of responsibility. But the trade-off was that there was a sense of, of power to being part of this, this new group. And there was a sense of invincibility. Uh, unfortunately, through sheer numbers, not through uh, any form of special powers. So uh, this crowd is not a, a group of people. It's not a collection of individuals. 
It is uh, something other. It's something separate from that. It's a completely different entity. This crowd is the primitive unconscious. This crowd is irrational. It's barbaric. It's a bunch of hooligans. Uh, it has the potential for violence. Uh, it has reduced intellectual capacity, reduced responsibility, and it operates at a heightened degree of emotionality. So it's quite a, a frightening thing, but it's also a very powerful thing. Now, the mechanisms uh, through which this crowd was, uh, I suppose, activated uh, were anonymity, suggestibility, and contagion. So first, you became a part of the crowd, and within this becoming part of the crowd, there was a loss of identity, a loss of self-control, and a loss of your, your conscious personality, as it's referred to. Um, this identity was, was swept away, and members succumb to the group mind and begin to act, in, uh, act homogeneously. So everyone begins to act in the same way. Um, and the primitive and irrational unconscious is revealed when, when this uh, conscious personality is removed. And the emotions from this irrational unconscious place sweep through the crowd, which then acts on instinctual and destructive drives. So according to this theory, the crowd is inherently uh, and utterly irrational. It is um, completely mad on a, on a very basic level. But uh, but to oh, excuse me, but to Le Bon, uh, the the madness of the crowd or the irrationality wasn't necessarily a, a drawback, or at least the crowd wasn't only something to be feared. The crowd was seen as something incredibly powerful. He wrote uh, that the crowd possesses the spontaneity, the violence, the ferocity, and also the enthusiasm of primitive beings, which is highly insulting, but it also gives you an idea of of what he thought of the crowd exactly. Um, and his theory wasn't uh, so much an explanation or an interrogation of crowd behavior, so much as it was a how-to. And his uh, theories uh, were used by some rather infamous uh, uh, historical characters like Mussolini and Hitler. And the whole idea behind, behind his work was to use the power of the, the crowd for the state rather than against the state. So there was an idea that somehow the state could harness the power of the crowd uh, to further the goals or to further political goals. But there are critiques of this account of crowd behavior. One is that it provides a completely decontextualized account of a human and social action. For example, it ignores the social context and it ignores those participating in the action. So it gives no account of why there was a mass action in the first place or uh, who else might have been involved. If we look at the UKZN student protests, uh, we can see clearly there was a, a clear reason for why, uh, why the students were protesting. We have a why for the mass action. And there were also others participating, opposing the action, and those were the police and security forces. And the problems with providing a stripped down or decontextualized account of social behavior is that it allows us to make assumptions about this thing called the crowd. So Le Bon's theory allows us to see the crowd as inherently irrational, inherently mad, and in a sense, inherently meaningless. It also produces a desocialized concept of identity. So there's no link between the self and society. The self is rational and the self controls behavior, but there seems to be no link between society and human behavior and action. So context has no influence over the self in this particular account. Further, if we see the crowd as irrational or pathological, we're essentially making their actions meaningless. Um, we're denying their voice. We give them no political power because we are rendering them, uh, in effect, uh, abject. Their voices mean nothing because their voices are mad. And along with this, there comes, well, along with this portrayal of the crowd as irrational, there, uh, there comes a denial of responsibility. And the responsibility, well, the denial of responsibility works in both directions. Crowd members can't really be held accountable uh, for their actions because they're acting irrationally and they are not under their own control. But society is also not held responsible because uh, if the crowd is an irrational thing, they're not objecting uh, to anything real or concrete, their behaviors are meaningless, therefore their protests can be denied and disavowed. 
And finally, what, what happens when we put all these things together is we end up with a system which allows for the repression, uh, well, legitimates the repression of uh, discordant voices in society. So both the crowd and the reasons for protest can be utterly and completely repressed. So finally, just to hopefully consolidate what we've covered to today, um, I'd like you to watch the following clip and consider. Think about the language used to frame the students' actions. Are the students pathological or irrational? Are they barbaric? Are they protesting without meaning or cause? Are they acting without reference to context? Who else or what other groups are participating in this social action? And are they accountable for their actions?